All right, so if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 45. Genesis 45. And so tonight, I want to talk about forgiveness. Not in the immediate sense that Jesus will forgive you, we'll get to that. Hopefully you know that. If you believe and you accept Jesus as your Savior, that He will forgive you of all of your sins, but I want to talk tonight about what that should do to you and how you should forgive others, how you should always be willing to forgive. Jesus went to the cross and died for you. As he was hanging from that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because love remembers no wrong. It holds on to no grudge. It does not keep score. It does not keep a record of the wrongs done. And in our life, That is not the way of the world. That is not the way that we are often brought up and taught. Most of us come from a background where you probably kept score when somebody did you wrong. You're like, I'm going to remember that. And there's going to come a day when you're not expecting it where I will have my vengeance, and I'm going to get you back, right? And sometimes you get that opportunity, and sometimes you take it, and it can feel good in the moment to be able to get revenge on somebody, can it? It can feel like, oh yeah, I've gotten some back, and sometimes you feel like they deserved it. And we're all guilty of it. You know, I've had people that have done me wrong. And a few times over the years, I've had the opportunity to get back at them, and I have. Before I started walking with Jesus. You know, there was a guy that I used to work with, and He got one over on me in a couple different commissions and got into some of my money. It's an unforgivable sin when you're in commission sales. Short time later, I was able to uh, see him fired and the best part was is my fingerprints weren't even on the murder weapon. That's the best way to get revenge is when you can triangulate it and somebody else does your dirty work. And they don't even know who was really behind the order. Those can be the most satisfying. If you are brought up in the way of the world. But that is not the way that God treats us. It is not the way that God wants us to treat others. And it runs counter to the will of God. And so tonight I want to look at a story from the book of Genesis. And the story is about a person named Joseph. How many of you in here know the story of Joseph? Most of you. Okay. 
So Joseph is one of the Old Testament patriarch figures. And Joseph is the favored son of his father. And Jacob... Sorry, Joseph is the son of Jacob. Jacob and Esau. And so Joseph is Jacob's favorite son. He gets the best outfit. He gets his father's praise and reward and he's a good son he's always looking out he's always doing good for his dad problem is joseph's got a lot of brothers and his brothers do not like him because he outperforms them all the time and makes them look bad and it's not that joseph's waking up in the morning make making a desire to make them look bad he's just doing what he does, and he's doing it as well as he can, and, you know, his brothers are not doing the same, and they're not looking out for their dad's interests in the same way, and they're not being diligent with their dad's property, and they are sometimes up to no good. And one time, Jacob is worried about his kids who are out of way. He sends Joseph, and Joseph brings back a report that, you know, tells what's going on, and it's not favorable. He doesn't embellish, but he doesn't lie to his father. He goes, hey, this is what the situation was. And his brothers hate him for it. And so they get to the point where they're like, we got to get rid of Joseph. Joseph has got to go. Joseph is throwing off the whole situation. And if he sticks around, it doesn't go well for any of us. So they decide that they are going to kill Joseph. They decide that they are going to get rid of him. But one of his brothers, a brother named Reuben, intervenes and says, hey, don't kill him. Then his blood will be on our hands. That would be bad. Let's sell him to some traders. We'll sell him into slavery. He'll be gone. The problem will be solved. We won't have to worry about him anymore. And we'll make a buck. Why kill him when we can, you know, look. We get two birds with one stone. We can make a little bit of money. We can get rid of our brother. We solve the problem. And we don't have any blood on our hands. I mean, we're just, there's so much winning this way. Why would we do it any other? And so that's what they decide to do. They're like, that sounds like a reasonable idea. And so when Joseph shows up, they throw him into a well. Short time later, some traders are coming along. They see them on their camel caravan and they go, hey, we got a deal for you. We got a deal. Strong worker, ready to go. 20 pieces of silver later, Joseph is being carted off to Egypt. The brother's not quite sure how to explain it to their father. They strip off Joseph's fancy, expensive robe, his multicolored or expensively crafted tunic, and they get some blood. They cover the coat in blood, and they bring it back to dad and go, hey, have you seen Joseph? And they're like, no, we sent him to come find you. We're like, well, we found his coat. And all of a sudden, oh, he must have been set upon by a wild animal and died, and his father was grief-stricken. Like, yeah, that must be what happened. And so they thought was the end of Joseph. They figured they'd never see from him again, hear from him again. That was it. Joseph was done. Joseph, as you might know, he winds up in Egypt. And he winds up working for a guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar is the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. He's very high up. You know, he's a guy that has direct access to Pharaoh, who is the king of Egypt, the ruler. He's the chief of his bodyguards, his top military advisor. So Joseph winds up in the house of this extremely wealthy, extremely powerful, extremely influential person. And the Lord is with Joseph. And Joseph does good work for Potiphar. So much so 
that everything he touches prospers and Potiphar eventually just lets him run everything. He goes, hey, you do great. Everything I give you is great. You just, you run my whole house. Amen. And so before Joseph knows it, you know, he is in charge of this extremely powerful, extremely wealthy dude's entire estate. So he's doing okay. Potiphar's wife, though, she's attracted to Joseph. She wants her some Joseph. You know, she is not interested in Joseph being loyal to Potiphar is like, how could I do this? He's given me everything in this house to run. How could I possibly do this evil thing? And so he refuses and refuses and refuses. And one day she corners him and he runs out of there, but she grabs his coat or his tunic or whatever. And then she decides because she has been spurned, which is a tough situation. You know, women can get kind of angry when you spurn their advances sometimes. A scorned woman is a difficult situation. It can be. So she decides, well, let's cry attempted rape. Brings it to her husband. Joseph is all of a sudden in trouble. Of course, he believes his wife. He's not going to believe, you know, Joseph. And Joseph finds himself in prison for a long time forgotten about. Until there's this dream that Pharaoh has that nobody can give the message to. And through a series of events, Joseph is a guy who can interpret this dream, and he is called up to do it. And he interprets it correctly. Pharaoh's amazed. And before Joseph knows it, he is now second in the kingdom only to Pharaoh. He is Pharaoh's right-hand guy. He gets the signet ring. He's now in charge of the whole country. He's the guy that runs the whole day-to-day. -day. If you were to think about it in terms of the way a lot of countries are run, you know, some of them will have a king that's sort of a symbolic figurehead, and then you have a prime minister. He's kind of like the prime minister, except the king can actually say no. But he lets him run everything. And Joseph does a great job. Joseph doesn't take revenge on Potiphar. He just focuses on doing a great job. And anyway, sometime later, there's a famine. There's seven years of huge abundance. Joseph makes provision because he says there's going to be seven great years and there's going to be seven terrible years. And so they stock up, they prep during the good years, they fill their barns, they surplus, they stockpile, they get ready. You know, Joseph is like the ultimate prepper. He gets the country ready for there not to be food around and available. Kind of like a lot of people do now in anticipation of society breaking down or whatever. It's amazing to me how mainstream like prepping for disaster has become. They even sell freeze-dried emergency food kits at Costco now. I was in there the other day and they had like, you know, 20-year shelf life, 144 meal freeze-dried bucket. I was like, you know, you got to be pretty afraid of the situation to be like, yeah, it's going to come down to that. And that's what's going to keep you going. It's like, I'd rather just, you know, get canned goods and stuff I would actually eat. And it's good to have a reserve. I mean, I tend to, I've always tend to have a backup for everything. I've been sort of a stockpiler. I was raised that way. It's the byproduct of being raised by a mother who was raised by somebody who survived a war and grew up on stories of hunger and deprivation. You got to keep extra around. You just never know. But not like, you know, seven years worth either. You know, just a reasonable amount of, of backup. But Joseph 
He's got everything ready to go and there's no food anywhere in the entire region when this famine becomes severe, including where his dad, Jacob, and all of the brothers live. There's no food and they're hungry and they're starving and they hear that there's food in Egypt. So dad sends them down to go get some food. And they show up in Egypt. And they show up and they appear before Joseph. And there's a whole lot that goes on. The story's got lots of twists and turns. But they don't recognize Joseph at all. One, they're not looking for him. You know, they, they, he got sold into slavery you know, at this point 20 plus years ago. It's been a long time that he's been gone. He's gotten older, but he doesn't look anything like he used to. He looks like an Egyptian now. He's dressed like an Egyptian. He would be shaved like an Egyptian. You know, Egyptians hated body hair. They were always shaving. They shaved their faces. They would shave their heads. They, had, they would shave their bodies. They were very much into super cleanliness. Joseph comes from shepherds that live out in the field. They don't shave. They're not shaving their head. They're not shaving their face. They got long beards. They're looking kind of scraggly. They smell like shepherds. Joseph looks like an Egyptian. So he doesn't look anything like he would have looked, not only because he's older, but, you know, he doesn't have the beard, he doesn't have the face, he's just, you know, they don't recognize him at all. But Joseph, he recognizes his brothers. He sees them. And he puts on this whole little show around being real harsh to them and doing all this stuff. And then finally... He can't hold it in anymore. He's overcome with emotion. And he reveals himself to them. In chapter 45, he says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who had stood by him. And he cried and sent everyone away. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my brother still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Imagine the shock, the awe, the sinking feeling in your stomach. The last time you saw your brother was when you nearly killed him and then you sold him off into slavery. Now he's the one with the entire food supply and literally holds the power of life and death in his hands. And you're in his country, and he's in charge of everything, and he can have all of you put to death right now. Unquestioned. He can call for a guard, point to him, and go whack them all. Take them out and put them all on pikes. Feed them to alligators or crocodiles, as it would be in Egypt. Whatever. He could do whatever he wanted with them. Think, if you had been given 20 years to ponder what you would do to these people that had done what they did to Joseph, and you had 20 years to think about it, when they finally showed up, would you be like, oh, the Lord has richly blessed me today because today vengeance will be mine. Is that what you would think? Would you be ready to take revenge? Would you be ready to get even for what they've done to you? But that's not what Joseph said. He said to them, And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant 
in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore it was not you who sent me here but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all of the land of Egypt. And he wept and he kissed his brothers and he sent for his father and they all move to Egypt where he prospers them. And he says to them, what you intended for evil, the Lord had meant for good. See, we don't always understand events as they're going on. And sometimes things that were done to you that were wrong, and the person even intended them to be wrong, the Bible says all things work together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it is amazing how the Lord can take injustices that are done to you and use them to transform you and to prepare you and to make you a person that can be used to do the work of the Lord. It is remarkable how forgiveness can change a person. See, Joseph wasn't angry. He wasn't upset. He wasn't furious at his brothers. Whatever anger he must have had for them, he let go a long time ago. I'm sure he had some in the beginning. But as time went on, and as his life progressed, somewhere in there, he realized why what happened happened and how it actually became a good thing and how the Lord was using him for a great and good purpose that could never have happened had what happened not occurred. And so he no longer holds any animosity towards his brothers. He doesn't hold any animosity towards Potiphar for putting him in prison. He doesn't hold any anger towards these slave traders because now as he stands there saving life and preserving life, he realizes that everything worked together for good. And the funny thing about when you refuse to forgive, when you hold on to hatred, is that when you refuse to forgive somebody, do you think that it really bothers the person who did you wrong? They did you wrong. Do you think that they care? No. They're not staying up at night angry about it. The anger inside of you, the hatred that you accumulate by refusing to forgive, there's only one person that that hatred and that anger corrodes and corrupts. And that's you. See, that's the thing about hate. Hate only corrodes the vessel that it's within. It corrodes the spirit within you. If you have love inside of you, then no hate that anybody throws at you can harm you. Because love makes you immune to the hatred of others. Because you see their hatred and you feel nothing but sorrow and compassion for them and a desire to see them transformed by the power of Jesus. That is why forgiveness is so central to what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, For if you forgive men... For their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. That's a scary statement to think about. 
Because what is Jesus saying here? If you won't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And you think to yourself, but I believe in Jesus, and Jesus promises that he's going to forgive me and give me eternal life. And So how could he say that? How could he say that and at the same time say that he's going to forgive me? But what does it mean to surrender to Jesus? Jesus says, this is how they will know that you are my disciples. By your love for one another. Does love hold grudges? Does love hold anger? Or does love unconditionally forgive and care? And so Jesus is saying this because ultimately to pick up your cross and be a disciple of Christ, you have to be willing to forgive. You have to be willing to not judge others. Now, it may not come all at once. You may very well have people that you are going to have to pray for, and you're going to have to pray that the Lord changes your heart. Help me to forgive this person. Help me to not be angry with them. Help me to share Jesus with them. But that needs to be your prayer, not help me get revenge. Not help me get even. Not help me get justice from them. Because Jesus says if they strike you on one cheek, turn the other and let them strike the other cheek as well. He goes on in chapter 7 of Matthew and says, Do not judge, lest you be judged. For in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. I want a lot of forgiveness. I want a lot of grace. I need a lot of grace. I do not want to stand before Jesus one day and have him go, I am prepared to be absolutely fair with you. We're going to look at your life. We're going to examine every deed. And we are going to be 100% fair. That's not a good deal. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all of my good deeds, at best, are like filthy rags. I have nothing of value that I can offer to the Lord in my sinful nature. What I want, what I need, what I hope for, is grace, forgiveness, mercy. And by the standard with which I give, so it shall be given back to me. We all want and need mercy in our lives. We all want and need forgiveness. Because all of us have done things that we are not proud of. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good your life looks on the outside. You're going to run into people and you're going to look at them sometimes and go, man, that life is perfect. Look at that guy. He's a leader at his church and he's married. He's got kids and... He's never been arrested, and everything just looks perfect in his life, and wow, what a great guy. But I promise you that even that guy would not want the 10 worst minutes of his life to show up on a replay film for the entire world to see. Because every one of us has done things that we're not proud of. Every one of us has done things that we are ashamed of. And there but for the grace of God go you. Sometimes people get caught. Sometimes they don't. It's not fair. But that is how the world works. But don't ever look at somebody else and think, oh, how perfect they must be. We all have sin in our lives. We've all done things that are wrong. And we all need forgiveness. And some of us need more than others. 
That's why Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. They don't need a doctor. I came for the sick. The ones that are the worst sinners become the most grateful. The woman at the well, with all of her husbands, she just couldn't get over how she was forgiven. Went to town, told everybody. She became a soul winner. Paul was a murderer of Christians. The chief sinner, he calls himself. He went from the worst sinner, the worst persecutor of the church, to the guy that wrote half of the New Testament. God has a limitless capability to transform your life and to turn you into an instrument for His will. And it starts with forgiveness. It starts with your willingness to love one another as Jesus loved you. And that means not holding a grudge. And that can take some time to get your head around. Even Peter. It's interesting that Peter is with Jesus the whole time, from the beginning of the ministry. He's there from day one. He's one of the early followers. He's heard all of Jesus' public teachings, private teachings, one-on-one teachings, the whole deal. He's there for all of it, 24-7. They're camping together. They're eating meals by the fire together. I mean, imagine if it was you and ten guys, and for like two years, all you did was spend time with each other. You were never away from each other. You slept out together. You ate your meals together. You knew when everybody went to the bathroom. The whole deal. And even Peter, it's interesting that you get later into the book of Matthew, in chapter 18, and he's been walking with Jesus now for a couple years. He's heard the Sermon on the Mount. He's seen the lessons. He's heard the parables. He's watched some miracles. He's been there the whole time. And even then, he goes up to Jesus and says, and if your brother sins, go and correct him in private. Hang on. Sorry. But then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, he's been with Jesus now for a while. He's been listening to the stories for a while. But he's still coming back with, can we get a specific number here of when I don't have to keep forgiving him? Can I get a ruling on the field? How many times am I actually required to do this forgiveness thing? You know, is it seven? Seven seems like a good number. It's a big number. But Jesus looks at him, and he tells a story, right? And he tells a story about these debtors. He tells a story about a guy that owes a little bit amount of money, and a guy that owes a ton of money. And the guy that owes a ton of money can't pay it back, and... He goes and he begs, and the amount of money that this guy owes is like millions and millions, like $10 million. It's a huge, absurd amount of money. Jesus uses a massive number to illustrate the situation. And this guy goes and begs forgiveness to the person he owes the money to, and he gets forgiven and sets him on his way. But then there was somebody else that he owed, that owed him a little bit of money. And when that guy showed up, and this guy just got forgiven $10 million. And so he goes to him and goes, I'm, I, owe, I can't pay you back. I know it's just a little bit, but I don't have anything. I Have patience with me. I'll, I'll get you your money. And he starts beating them and calls them worthless and has them thrown into the debtor's prison back then. And the first 
guy hears about it and says, I can't believe you didn't have mercy after all that mercy I had on you, after all that forgiveness I had on you. You know what? Throw you into prison too until you can figure it out. And so Jesus says, so shall my heavenly Father also do for you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. And so... Jesus says 70 times 7, essentially infinite. That's kind of the more, in the, the language of the day, that was kind of what was meant by the expression. Seven's this complete number, 70 times 70, so it's this complete times a multiple of the complete, just keep forgiving them. And then to drive that story home, it's not literal, hey, 7 times 70, what is that number? That's it, I can officially check you off my list. That's not what's being conveyed. And to hammer it home, he tells the story of the $10 million of forgiveness. Jesus wants you to forgive because he forgave you. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life for you. And he died on a cross for you. And then he rose again from the dead. And if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you can have forgiveness and eternal life. Because it is the gift of God. Lest no man boast. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything to accumulate it. Except ask Jesus to forgive you to repent, and to change your life. And Jesus wants you to forgive as you've been forgiven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for tonight. Father, I pray that if there is somebody here who does not know you, that tonight would be the night that they would come to you, Jesus. That as we have our heads bowed, they would just pray to you and go, Lord, I am a sinner. I have broken your law, and tonight I ask you to forgive me. I am asking you to save me, sweet Jesus. Come into my life and change me. I am ready to serve you and to walk with you all the days of my life. Oh Lord, I pray for these men. I pray that you would fill them with your spirit, that you would make your face shine upon them, Lord, that you would help them grow in their walk with you, that you would put a hedge of protection around the warrior center, Father, that you would not allow the enemy one foothold here, Lord, but that your angels would be given charge concerning this place, and that from here revival would come to Memphis, Lord, that these men would go and they would preach and they would teach the gospel to every person they encounter and let them know what Jesus has done for them and what he can do for all of us. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, it is in the matchless name of Yeshua. Messiah Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.